All right, so welcome back everyone to our geophysics uh, and tectonics seminar um, this week. I'm excited uh, that our speaker is Kaylee Condit from the University of Washington, uh, who'll be talking about slow earthquakes in subduction zones um, with uh, different constraints. Um, so uh, Kaylee, whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me, Keely. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for coming um, to this talk. Uh, so uh, before I get started, I want to just acknowledge my um, collaborators on this work. So Melody French, Victor Guevara, Jonathan Delph, Cinti Lee, Lawrence Young, and Emily Chin. Um, uh, this work certainly could not be possible without, um, without them. And I, I started this work when I was a postdoc at Rice University. Um, and so a lot of this work is actually funded by their Weiss postdoctoral fellowship. Um, all right. And so actually, before I get into the science science part, of my talk, I want to just spend a couple of moments on diversity, equity, and inclusion work that I've been doing. Um, and so with the uprisings this summer and the movement for Black Lives and the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and um, so many other uh, Black Americans, um, I think that a lot of us in the academic community have uh, reaffirmed and recentered our work towards DEI. Um, and so I want to just talk about a couple of initiatives or topics that I've been working on. And first is the um, Research Experience in Solid Earth Science for Students program, RECESS, which is a summer undergraduate research program run through UNAVCO in Boulder, Colorado. Um, this is an 11 week long uh, intensive summer research program directed at increasing um, diversity in the geosciences and targeting specifically uh, members of groups that are historically underrepresented. And so I've been working with Recess since about 2012. Um, and it's an excellent program that if you have undergraduates that are part of a historically underrepresented group in the geosciences, I encourage you to um, show them this program that they could apply for, um, or if you yourself are a member of a historically underrepresented group, um, be aware of this program because it's excellent. Um, it offers longitudinal mentorship. So it's not just, um, you know, an 11 week summer program. There's also money to go to uh, AGU or GSA or another conference. And um, the mentors of these students are, you know, really involved with these mentees long after they finish the program. And so I have still been involved and in communicating with mentees that I worked with in 2012 and 2017, um, 2019, things like that. So there's a website there, check it out. It's an awesome program. Um, I also just wanna advertise and suggest uh, uh, implementing something like this distinguished lecture series in your, um, in your department. So in the Earth and Space Sciences Department at the University of Washington, we have built a, uh, program that is part of our colloquia series, but it's targeting early career BIPOC and LGBTQ plus speakers. Um, and we're doing this to build relationships with diverse scientists so that if we want to diversify our faculty, we've already started building relationships with diverse candidates. Um, and we're featuring a wide range of identities within our speaker series that can help us build diversity within our own department and the geoscience community broadly. Um, we also have a mentoring for leadership lunch series as part of this where graduate students and postdocs get to interact with the speakers and then of course we compensate these speakers with an honorarium um, and i'm happy to say that our faculty voted to make this a policy that about a third of our colloquia are going to be featuring dls speakers or at least a third um, and then lastly um, I, in my own lab group, build an equity into our group culture. And so we read DEI papers in group meetings and discuss them as we would a regular um, tectonic science paper. Uh, we talk about equity and inclusion with my students and I encourage and reward DEI work because I really feel strongly that this is not extra work. DEI work is a vital part of our job. Um, so I'm happy to talk about any of these things later. So you can shoot me an email um, or we can chat after this. Okay. Subduction zones. Um, so subduction zones are places where we have oceanic lithosphere that's diving down underneath some overriding plate. Um, these zones host the most devastating volcanic eruptions on Earth and also the largest earthquakes on Earth. Um, and these two geologic hazards, I would argue, are um, both uh, really related to the processes that are happening on the plate boundary, both chemical and mechanical processes. Um, and so if we look at a subduction zone and a slightly a more realistic cartoon here, um, this plate interface right here is a very fluid rich zone. Um, I work particularly right now on the subduction plate interface, which is this fault zone shear zone here. 
Um, and we know from the exhumed rock record that it's a really lithologically diverse zone. So there's lots of different rock types. That's really important for some of the processes that I'm gonna talk about today. At shallow depths, this uh, plate interface is a brittle fault zone. Um, we see evidence for pseudotacolite or these fossil earthquakes, um, evidence for lots of fluid flow. And rather than it being some planar, you know, uh, fault plane, it's actually this tabular fault zone that has some thickness of, a, you know, tens to a couple hundred meters. At deeper depths, um, the plate interface transitions from a brittle fault zone into a ductile shear zone. It still remains really lithologically heterogeneous. There's lots of evidence for um, fluid flow and um, processes that the fluids are doing, including, you know, maybe fracturing and metasomatism or chemical alteration. Um, and so, I'm gonna be focusing in on these fluids today because I think they're an integral part of uh, these slow earthquakes, um, but these fluids are influencing and facilitating a lot of the chemical and mechanical processes on the plate boundary. And so when we think about these chemical transformations, the process that's happening um, as this oceanic lithosphere is subducted is influencing our global element cycling and also what material is making it down into these arc source regions. And um, we see a lot of evidence for these chemical transformations in the form of these water bearing minerals or um, metamorphic minerals that have water in their crystalline structure, mineral bound water. There's a lot of evidence for metamorphic reactions that are happening. And as this cold lithosphere gets subducted and heats up, it transforms. Um, metamorphically, we see evidence for chemical alteration. And then as we progressively heat up these rocks, we have a loss of water and volatiles um, from them. And these hydrous minerals transform into less hydrous or anhydrous minerals and release those fluids into the rock around them. And then if we think about the way these rocks flow and break and their fault zone behaviors, we uh, know that the um, shallow parts of this Subduction interface are locked. This is the last seismogenic zone um, relatively near to the trench um, at these shallow depths. And you know, this is where strain is just building up and then is released in these large mega thrust earthquakes. And then as we transition and the temperatures get warmer along this plate interface, um, the rocks begin to deform dominantly by ductile deformation mechanisms. And so the rocks are just sort of tectonically creeping. Um, but there's an interesting thing in some subduction zones that's been recognized in the regions between the locked seismogenic zone and this ductile deformation. And these are these slow earthquakes or episodic tremor and slip, which is a series of phenomenon that I'm gonna focus on today. And these have really been recognized because we have you know, uh, really nice instrumentation at several uh, subduction zones that are currently deforming. And so through seismic observations and GPS observations, we've recognized these um, new slip behaviors in this region. Okay, so what is ETS um, or episodic tremor and slow slip? Um, it's composed of two phenomenon, um, these cyclic slow slip events. Um, and I'm specifically gonna be talking about slow slip events that are happening down dip of the seismogenic zone. There are slow slip events that occur up dip of the seismogenic zone, but that's not the focus of my talk. Um, these slow slip events are occurring um, periodically and they have recurrence intervals on the order of months to years. Um, these events occur over weeks to months and can release as much energy as a magnitude six or seven and a half um, earthquake. So they're releasing quite a bit of energy. Um, when we have a slow slip event, it's slipping at rates that are faster than tectonic slip rates, but much slower than earthquake rates. Um, and they appear to be temporally and spatially coincident with this phenomenon called tremor. And they are occurring, we think, along the plate interface. Um, and so tremor or non-volcanic tremor, it's also sometimes called tectonic tremor, is a series of low frequency earthquakes we think. Um, and the intensity of tremor appears to be proportional to the amount of slow slip. Um, and so these phenomenon appear to be temporally and uh, spatially co-located um, at least a first order on the plate interface during one of these ETS events. And this is occurring at depths between maybe 25 and 65 kilometers on the plate interface. And so here's just a, uh, you know, set of images of where we see slow slip and tremor. These are some of the subduction zones that we observe slow slip and tremor here on this map. And what you can see in these inset images is just the spatial locations of um, tremor and slow slip. And so in teal here, if we focus in on Alaska, in teal, these contours are plate depth 
um, to the subducting plate. And we can see in green, these are slow slip events. And in red, this is where tectonic tremor is occurring. And you can see that this tremor and slow slip is occurring down dip of this large patch that failed in the 1964 megathrust earthquake. We see a similar pattern when we look at Nankai in Japan, where we have tremor and slow slip that's occurring down dip of these patches that failed in these large megathrust earthquakes. And then as a uh, resident of Seattle, Washington, my favorite subduction zone is Cascadia. And you can see in Cascadia, we have tremor and slow slip that's occurring here down dip of um, what would be the lock seismogenic zone and probably is, but we haven't had a large megathrust earthquake for at least um, 300 years here. So we're probably due, which is fun. Um, and so importantly, these deep slow slip events have been shown to precede large megathrust earthquakes. And they're certainly contributing to the sub subduction zone slip budget. And so um, understanding what's happening when we have these slow slip events, what mechanisms might be producing them, what processes are leading to them is really important for folding them into our broader um, uh, seismic cycle in subduction zones and, um, and understanding seismic hazard at these zones. And so from geophysical constraints on ETS, um, observations that we've made along the plate boundary in subduction zones that host ETS, um, tell us that this is a really fluid rich environment. There have been seismic observations like um, very slow uh, shear wave velocities that require basically that this is a fluid rich environment and there's like free fluids around at these conditions. Um, and that's what I'm showing here on the left in this um, shear wave velocity map of, of cross sections through Cascadia. Um, and then people have done some rheological work on this region and shown that um, tidal forces can actually trigger these slow slip events. And so this is just on the order of a couple of kilopascals. These are really um, small forces. Um, and that has been uh, used to suggest that this is, you know, has very low differential stresses in this area. Um, and so together, this fluid rich environment, these low differential stresses has been inferred um, to represent an area of high pore fluid pressures. Um, and then just importantly, um, these slow slip events and ETS generally um, uh, tend to happen in relatively warm subduction zones, which I'll come back to um, later on in the talk. Um, okay, so what are some mechanisms that have been proposed for ETS? Um, so, you know, if we have this zone of high pore fluid pressure in this region in between the seismogenic zone and where we have ductile creeping dominating, um, what's actually happening in the rocks? Um, I am a geologist, a uh, structural geologist and a metamorphic petrologist, so I really am interested in what these rocks are really doing and what we can tease out from these rocks. And so some workers have looked at exhumed fossil subduction interfaces that are, you know, exhumed from similar conditions to where we see ETS today, and they have suggested, well, we see a lot of evidence for um, ductal or viscous deformation and brittle deformation, and so maybe it's a mixed brittle viscous deformation mechanism that's occurring here. And so here's an example from the Mugi Melange in Japan, and um, I, I believe, and you can see here, there's this viscous melange foliation that's developing, um, and then it's cross-cut at this high angle by these coaxial quartz veins um, that may represent some tremor source, and potentially this melange foliation may represent, you know, some foliation that's developing during these slow slip events. And so, um, you know, these fractures are, you know, probably forming from uh, like a hydro fracturing um, mechanism during these periods of elevated pore fluid pressure. So the fluid pressure is potentially important here. And then another um, hypothesis has been activation of frictional mechanisms. Um, and so, you know, in, in the rate and state friction world, um, if you have some material that is velocity strengthening, meaning that it, you know, as, as the material uh, deforms at faster and faster conditions, it actually is going to strengthen. Um, so it's not going to run away into a large earthquake, but if you can activate um, this velocity strengthening material through frictional deformation, potentially through um, lowering the effective normal stress during these periods of high pore fluid pressure, maybe this frictional deformation can be, um, uh, you know, representing this slow slip. And then we might have fracturing of more competent or stronger material within the um, within the plate boundary that might represent tremor. But in both of these cases, there's many other mechanisms that people have proposed for, for ETS, but in both of these cases and many of the cases that people have, have suggested um, might actually represent ETS, aqueous fluids are important to vital for these mechanisms. And so what I want to do with this talk today is is to talk about like what we can learn from observations of ETS source regions. And as I said, I'm a geologist. And so I look at the exhumed rock record um, and try to see how that might compare to geophysical observations of the plate boundary. 
Um, and so I'm interested in like, what are the lithologies that are present at these conditions? Um, you know, that can tell us something about the rheology. What are the structures that we observe? What are the PT conditions? Um, and what are the fluid and stress conditions? And so to do this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about observations I have from the rock record, and then integrate that with some constitutive relations or sort of rheological relationships between stress and strain rate to try to understand what might actually be um, happening in these rocks when they're deforming at various uh, strain rates. And then I'm gonna bring in a little bit of petrologic modeling at the end to try to think about what the source for these fluids or these potential high pore fluid pressure um, fluids might be. And so we're gonna start looking at the rock record. This is a field photograph of the upper Engadine Valley in Switzerland. And this is an exhumed subduction interface. Um, this is a fossil subduction interface. You can see we're actually standing within this subduction interface right here, looking across the upper Engadine Valley. And you can see here is that subduction interface right here. These rocks are exhumed here. And then here's that overriding plate is actually preserved right here. Um, and so we have that contact preserved nice which is very helpful. Um, so this is just to situate you a little bit more. We're in the Central Alps right here. So, you know, this is, we're looking in Europe right here. Um, and these teal units, these Paninic units represent the Paninic Ocean that closed um, uh, in the lead up to the Alpine orogeny. Um, and these gray units here, the Austro-Alpine units, this is that overriding plate. Um, and boundary between them right in here in this black box, this is a, a zone called the Arosa zone. It's also sometimes called the Platonap at these deeper depths. Um, and this contact between these two units represents a, a paleo um, subduction interface. And so if we zoom into this box right here, here's a simplified geologic map of this region. We're in Eastern Switzerland right now. Um, uh, and this dashed line here represents that contact between these Paninic units and that overriding Austro-Alpine plate. Um, and uh, this green unit here, this is the South Paninic, um, unit, this is actually represents the subduction interface rocks. Um, and this is a Cretaceous to Paleogene subduction boundary, and it represents the closure of this Paninic Ocean between um, the European and Adriatic plates, also called the Astro Alpine, um, before the Alpine orogeny. And so this is a really unique exposure because at shallow depths, um, the exposure is relatively, um, or at and in the north, the exposure is, is exhumed at relatively shallow depths and it gets deeper and deeper as you go to the south. Um, and so, you know, in the north, these temperatures uh, represent the temperatures that these rocks experienced, oops, sorry, during subduction. Um, and you can see that they heat up as we go farther and farther to the south. Um, and so these paleo depths are increasing from about maybe 10 kilometers in the north to 30 to 35 kilometers in the south. Um, and importantly, we've, seen observations of um, pseudotachylite, which are these fossil earthquakes. This is a frictional melt that happens um, during an earthquake. And it's sort of our best um, constraint on <laughs> actually uh, from the rock record of an earthquake um, occurring within these rocks. And we see this uh, within you know, tens of meters of this plate boundary in the overriding plate between um, about 200 and 300 degrees. And so this has been inferred to be a paleoseismogenic zone in this region between 200 and 300 degrees here. Um, and so, you know, as I said, when I introduced this topic, ETS appears to be happening down dip of the seismogenic zone. So maybe these deeper parts of this subduction interface that are exhumed here would be a good place to go look for potentially ETS or what the conditions of ETS might be. And so this is just a block diagram that I've modified from Bachman et al. 2019 or 20, 2009. And you can see this is sort of what, you know, this is that Arosa zone or these are the subduction interface here. Here's that overriding plate here. And you can see there's this zone of pseudotachylate in here. But if we go to the deeper depths in this area, this might be a good place to go look for um, evidence of ETS in the rock record. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some key observations from the rock record from these areas down in this zone right here. And so what I'm going to do right now is just show you uh, some geologic mapping that I've done with my colleague Melody French in this area. Um, and so we have these two sites that we looked at. Um, they're both exhumed from, you know, 30-ish, a little bit more than 30 kilometers uh, paleo depths. Um, they experience temperatures of about 300 to 400 in site one and 400, and 400 to 450 in site two. And you can see that they're really lithologically diverse. And so these zones here, um, in between these two black lines here and here, these are the rocks that represent this plate interface. You know, they are exhumed from that subduction interface shear zone. 
Um, and then here are just some cross sections through these units. And you can see they're really lithologically diverse. So they're you know, between 400 and 500 meters thick. They have these tabular layers of serpentinite, metasedimentary rocks, mafic schists, metabasalts, and importantly, talc schists. And in both of these units, we see evidence for a lot of metasomatism and fluid activity. And so this is what this looks like actually in the field. We're actually standing within this subduction interface um, rocks right here. And so this is that contact with the overriding plate. This is that overriding plate rocks here. And you were standing actually within this ancient subduction shear zone. And you can see we have, you know, serpentinite. This gully here is actually a talc schist um, right in here. It is really soft rock. So it just erodes really easily. We have these mica schists and calcareous schists, some meta basalts over here, and then more serpentinite. So it's a really lithologically diverse zone. And in all of these lithologies, we see some interesting activity of fluids. And so here's an example from a massive metabasalt, and it has these epidote veins passing through it. You can see subhorizontal right here, and then it's cross-cut by these quartz veins. Um, and so these veins are awesome because they are a great recorder both of the fluid environment and the mechanical environment um, when they form. And so, right, so these veins are forming as fractures, so they are representing some breaking of the rock, and then they um, represent whatever the fluid was doing <laughs> because um, fluids are moving into that fracture space that opens up um, and precipitating this material. And so they're a great recorder of um, the fluid and, and mechanical environment when they form. Um, we can contrast this massive metabasalt that really doesn't have any viscous deformation preserved within it um, with this foliated calc schist. Um, and so you can see it's strongly foliated, these subhorizontal foliation planes here that are forming. Um, and these are uh, parallel to these uh, quartz and calcite veins, you can see here that are getting recrystallized and reworked in this foliation. Um, and so this calcite is this brown material here, and then the quartz is this white material here. And so um, in both of these rocks and, and within this whole interface, we have a lot of lithologic diversity and a lot of evidence for um, fluids doing interesting things. And so we see this in both the veins within this region and then some of the metasomatism that we observe and the production of talc. Um, and chlorite schists, which are these metasomatic or you know, rocks that form during chemical alterations of protoliths um, in this region. So there's a lot of fluid activity here. Um, and so what I'm gonna do quickly is talk about observations from one specific rock type. This is a foliated politic schist that's riddled with these quartz crack seal veins. And I'm gonna use it as sort of a barometer of the conditions of ETS within the subduction interface, or at least the conditions of um, you know, deformation, stress, fluids um, within this plate interface uh, that may have hosted ETS. And so this is my collaborator, Melody French here for scale. Um, and so if we zoom in and look at what this face looks like, we can see um, this is this foliated politic schist. It began its life as some um, shale at the ocean floor um, before it was subducted. And it's riddled with these quartz crack seal veins. And so you can see here's that that trace of that uh, viscously developing foliation. Um, and then it's cross cut at these high angles with these quartz veins. And so if we zoom in and actually look at the microstructures within this rock, we can tell something about the way this rock was deforming and potentially the conditions of this deformation. And so this is a full thin section photomicrograph and cross polarized light of what this rock looks like. Um, here are these blocky elongate quartz veins that are, you know, um, moving through this rock and they're cross cutting this viscously developed foliation. And so here's the trace of that foliation right here. And so I'm really interested in what we can tell about the microstructures in this foliation, because that can tell us something about the pressure and temperature conditions that this deformation occurred at, and then also how this deformation might have actually been accommodated within the rock. Um, and so this is the mineral assemblage um, that's defining this foliation. We have quartz and fengite, which is a white mica, this mineral called albite, which is a sodium rich feldspar, actinolites, diphenylmaline, and some other accessory minerals. But this mineral assemblage is representative of, you know, sort of growing at the peak pressure and temperature conditions um, that this rock experienced. And so these PT conditions of foliation are about 350 degrees and about representing about 30 kilometers paleo depth. So it was sort of deforming at 30 kilometers in the subduction zone. And, you know, we can look at the microstructures here and we can see sort of evidence for two different deformation mechanisms. And so if we look at, you know, this plane polarized image right here, um, we can see these microlithons or sort of these layers of, uh, of uh, mica and amphibole and these layers of this white material, which is, you know, I normally thought was quartz in here. And so this um, 
alternating layering is really indicative of this deformation mechanism called pressure solution creep. Um, but we also see, if you look in cross-polarized light at some of these domains, that there's also evidence for dynamic recrystallization or crystal plastic deformation um, in the form of dislocation creep. And so when I first started working on this rock and I was looking at it just optically with a microscope, I was thinking, oh, great, there's lots of quartz in here. We have, you know, quartz is deforming by pressure solution creep, and then maybe it's getting overprinted a little bit, or there's a little bit of evidence for dynamic recrystallization of quartz. That's excellent. We know a lot about quartz and the way quartz deforms um, from experimental constraints. And so we can use that to understand something about the rheology of this rock. Um, uh, but then I did more work and I realized that actually a lot of that fine grained material that looks like quartz and these really fine grained rocks actually wasn't quartz. Um, it was a mineral called albite, I mentioned this feldspar. And so what I'm showing right here is just a false colored um, chemical map made on the electron microprobe. It's actually a set of stacked maps and um, aluminum rich minerals are represented in red. Um, magnesium rich minerals here are represented in green and calcium rich minerals are represented in blue. Um, and so you can see, right, that uh, these black minerals, <laughs> this is quartz, right? Because quartz doesn't have any aluminum, magnesium, or calcium in it. Um, and so I'm just like highlighting where the quartz is right now in this sample. Um, there's not very much quartz in this rock. Uh, and the quartz isn't super interconnected. And we would expect it to be interconnected and forming bands if the quartz is really um, sort of controlling the rheology of this rock. But if we look at this red mineral here, this is actually albite. Um, and there's a lot more albite here and it's a lot more interconnected um, than the quartz is. And so this suggests to me that um, albite deformation may be actually uh, really key to understand in the rheology of this rock. And so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna look at sort of some flow laws and uh, think about the deformation mechanisms we just looked at to understand something about the relationships between stress and strain rate within this rock and whether this viscous deformation that we observe here could be potentially accommodating slow slip. And so I'm just um, plotting um, on this diagram where we're plotting shear stress versus strain rate here, um, two flow laws specifically for quartz for these two deformation mechanisms that we observe. And so in the solid yellow line, I'm, I'm plotting the thin film model for pressure solution creep of quartz. Pressure solution um, is this deformation mechanism where we have dissolution of a mineral on these high pressure, uh, high stress sides, and then that uh, material then precipitates in these uh, strain shadows. Um, and so it requires some fluid, some green boundary fluid in the rock to, to form. And importantly, um, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, linearly viscous, it's a Newtonian rheology. So you can hear, see here's this uh, stigma, this is stress, has a stress exponent of one. Um, and then also importantly, it's grain size dependent. So this mechanism is weaker when the rock has smaller grains in it um, uh, than if it has larger grains. And so you can see here's this D, this is this grain size term. We can contrast that with dislocation creep of quartz, this equation down here, where we can see there's no grain size, there's no D in here, this is grain size independent, and it has a stress exponent of four. So this is some power law creep. And this is plotted in here, um, this dashed orange, uh, orange line. And so we can then compare this, right? Because I said, you know, quartz isn't the only mineral in here. We also have albite, this, um, uh, sodic feldspar, and you can see I'm plotting here the thin film model pressure solution creep for albite, and then also dislocation creep of albite on here. And you can see that this thin film model pressure solution for albite is actually slightly weaker than quartz um, at these grain sizes, um, but dislocation creep in the feldspar um, is much stronger. So you can see over here, you need really high stresses to accommodate uh, relatively uh, slow strain rates within the rock if you have dislocation creep. This all jives really nicely with the deformation mechanisms that we saw um, and the microstructures that we saw within this rock, um, right? So we're seeing evidence for um, pressure solution creep and maybe some dislocation creep within the quartz rocks, um, minerals specifically, but you know, what does this have to do with ETS? Well, we can say, Okay, some typical stresses along the plate interface are in the tens of MPA. So that's sort of the stresses that we have to play around with that we might be able to use to see sort of what strain rates we can, we can reach at those stresses. Um, and so at typical tectonic strain rates in here um, for this rock, you can see that we are really easily able to access um, with these stresses we think we have present um, these deformation mechanisms. And actually viscous rheology within this rock can accommodate these tectonic strain rates really nicely. Um, but if we compare that to slow slip strain rates that we would expect within this rock, um, you can see that we would need hundreds of MPAs to access um, 
or even higher to access, you know, uh, viscous deformation at these kinds of strain rates. Um, and so what I think this is telling us is that viscous deformation in the albite of the quartz, at least in this rock, um, can't facilitate slow slip and strain rate. Um, and importantly, nominally, these deformation mechanisms aren't going to be really affected by um, variations in the pore fluid pressure um, within this rock. And so I think what this means is, you know, we can play a similar game with the other rock types that we see within this plate interface. And uh, my collaborator, Melody French, and I actually um, did this. She did some awesome rheological modeling from the plate boundary using this erosa zone as an example. Um, I don't have time to go deeply into it, but you know, we're essentially combining geologic observations with constituent relations that we know from the lab or what the lab suggests the uh, relationship between stress and strain rate is here. And so what we saw was that right at these low stresses and low to moderate pore fluid pressures, this viscous deformation in say the metasedimentary units like that schist that I just showed you can accommodate these tectonic creeping strain rates. And so this is sort of what this might look like um, on a more circle diagram. But as we elevate um, pore fluid pressure, you have pore fluid pressure um, elevated within this rock, you can actually activate frictional deformation mechanisms and you can activate these velocity strengthening deformation mechanisms or frictional deformation within the talc and the chlorate schists and easily accommodate slow slip strain rates. And so, you know, we're sort of moving our more circle over through this uh, increase in pore fluid pressure, which lowers this effective normal stress. And so I told you that I thought the lithologic variability in here was really important for, you know, producing these variations in deformation that we're observing. Um, and so I think we're seeing this partitioning of deformation between lithologies that um, can be dependent on pore fluid pressure. And so if, if this is dependent on pore fluid pressure, we can then ask the question, you know, where might these fluids be sourced? If this elevated pore fluid pressure is really important for potentially producing these slow slip events or producing these tremor sources, um, you know, then the fluids become really integral in this equation and it's interesting to think about where they might be sourced. And so we can think about sort of the fluid structure of the plate boundary, um, right? And so we were just interested in this zone where we have high pore fluid pressures, we think, um, at these depths. And so we can think about where fluids might be coming from. And so obviously this oceanic plate is sitting on the ocean floor. Um, and so it's, um, you know, going to have shallow pore fluids that are, you know, um, infiltrating into the plate. Um, but we think that these shallow pore fluids are actually expelled during um, this pore collapse at depths of less than 15 kilometers. So we don't think that this fluid is actually making all its way um, as free fluid all the way across the seismogenic zone to these depths of ETS. And instead, we think we actually um, you know, have these metamorphic fluid sources that are coming from these devolatilization reactions that I mentioned to you earlier in the, in the talk. Um, but these metamorphic reactions are controlled by pressure and temperature. Um, and so really the, the uh, thermal structure of the plate boundary becomes incredibly important when we start thinking about the production of this metamorphic fluid. Um, and indeed stable isotopic data from the rock record suggests that along this whole interface at these deeper depths, these fluids are sourced from metamorphic rocks or these metamorphic devolatilization reactions. And in fact, I don't have time to go into it today, but we do have evidence from this lytic schist that I was just showing you of metamorphic fluids that are actually, um, were the source of the silica that precipitated in these crack seal veins. Okay, so I mentioned that these PT conditions or the thermal structure of the subduction zone are really important. Um, and so what I've just overlaid on this tectonic cartoon right now are these isotherms showing, you know, some typical potential thermal structure here. And so because we are subducting this cold oceanic material into this warm asthenosphere, you know, we're creating this cold nose as the subduction zone um, matures thermally. So we're getting these cold temperatures to much deeper depths. And so this is really influencing where we're going to have these um, metamorphic reactions. And so what I'm interested in is to get this pore fluid pressure do we have to have metamorphic reactions that are happening at much deeper depths and then require movement of this fluid up dip along the plate interface, you know, potentially uh, tens to hundreds of kilometers, or can we actually have this fluid form in situ? And so to do this, what I've done is with some of my colleagues, I have compared um, the thermal structure of these subduction zones where we have tremor and flow slip to thermodynamic models where I predict where we would have uh, metamorphic devolatilization um, within the rock. 
And so you can see here is just the three subduction zones or the six subduction segments um, where we have, um, I'm showing the occurrence of tremor here in this map view. And you can see this now here on this histogram view versus depth. You can see the distribution of tremor in these zones. Um, and then in pink, I'm just showing where we have these slow slip events. Oops. And so I'm comparing it to the thermal structure that we uh, get from these uh, kinematic dynamic geodynamic models that are predicting the thermal structure right in these regions where we have tremor and slow slip. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm taking those PT paths and I'm creating these thermodynamic models in this modeling package called Perplex, which is this Gibbs free energy minimizing program. And it allows us to predict the mineral assemblage of specific rock types um, over pressure and temperature range. And so what I'm showing right here is a PT diagram. You can see depth is over there on the, on the uh, other side of the Y axis. And I'm just contouring this for the amount of mineral bound water or water that's mineral bound in these hydrous minerals in your average mid-ocean ridge basalt or morb. And so you can see that there's a lot of water at these cold high pressure conditions. These are blue species conditions. And as the rock heats up, there's a much less water. And so as this rock would transition across one of these zones, where there's lots of water to less water bound within it. That metamorphic reaction is going to release fluids and we're going to produce fluids at those conditions. And so this is just the depth range of ETS. And um, we can couple this to these slab top PT paths. And that's what I'm just showing right here. These are the slab top PT paths for these specific subduction segments. And then we can extract the amount of mineral bound water. Um, and where we have dehydration reactions, that's going to be a, a zone of metamorphic fluid production. And so we can sort of follow a rock that's traveling along one of these PT paths, see where it's losing its water, and then directly compare it to where we see tremor and slow slip within the subduction zone. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> The only rock that's getting subducted is not more, as we saw this is a really, uh, this is a really lithologically diverse zone. And so I've actually done this analysis for four different rock types. So we've looked at average mid-ocean ridge basalt, seafloor altered mid-ocean ridge basalt, um, depleted more mantle or ultramafic lithology, and then a metapellite. And you can see they have really different patterns in where we have water bound within them, the minerals in these rocks uh, across the same PT space. And I want to just note quickly that these are all uh, calculated using fluid saturated conditions. And so uh, I want to just also note quickly that we extract this water not just along this PT path, but also along a plus and minus 50 degree path. And this just encompasses sort of the uncertainty that we have in our thermodynamic models and in these geodynamic thermal models. Um, so we extract this water across this entire swath. And so I'm going to just plot the results of this analysis for these six subduction segments. Um, and so you can see I'm going to plot mineral bound water here on the x axis versus depth or pressure along that PT path and compare it directly to the distribution of tremor and slow slip at those same depths. And so first what I'm just plotting here is this metapellite, this dark rock re line represents the actual PT path of that slab based on this model and then that um, gray zone represents that sort of uncertainty plus or minus 50 degree interval. And you can see that within metapellites or these sort of, you know, um, metasedimentary rocks, we have sort of progressive loss of fluids, but we don't have any zones where we have quite a bit of fluid lost all in sort of one narrow pressure uh, temperature range or narrow depth range. But we do see evidence for quite a bit of fluid release at very specific depths when we look at these altered morbs. Um, and then we also see this even more when we look at this average morb composition. And so you can see here we have, you know, one to two weight percent water that's getting released at these PT conditions of tremor and slow slip. Um, Within, within this average more lithology. And then we can compare that quickly to this ultramafic rock where we have very little fluid production because the antigorite or the serpentine is just stable um, across this entire PT range with the exception of Yuliska Kalima, which is our warmest PT path. And so I think what we're seeing here is that metamorphic dehydration in mafic rocks is providing in situ fluid sources at the depths of, of slow slip and tremor. This is really cool. This is consistent with um, the isotopic record. Um, but we can ask the question, uh, what dehydration reactions are releasing this water? And so quickly, I want to just zoom into Guerrero and look at this and try to see what metamorphic reactions are actually happening here. And so what I'm plotting here is just showing you Guerrero. This is the PT path for Guerrero down here on the bottom left. And this is this mineral box plot. And you can think about this as just showing you the um, mineralogy of this rock as we move along this PT path. 
And, you know, so you can see this is sort of the percent of each mineral that's within this rock. And you can see that the mineralogy changes quite a bit across this PT path. Um, we can also extract the water across this PT path, and we can see that at about 40, 45 kilometers, we're losing a ton of water, not a ton, well, more than a ton, literally, but we're losing um, several weight percent water. And you can see this correlates really nicely with observed tremor within this subduction interface. And this also correlates with the, with the breakdown of this mineral called chlorite, which is a hydrous mineral, and growth of calcic amphiboles, this mineral called epidote, and then anhydrous minerals, um, garnet and oomphocyte. And so we can compare this to the slightly colder PT path and the slightly warmer PT path here to just encompass the whole range. And we can see that in both of these lithologies, uh, these PT path ranges, we are losing a lot of fluid at the same PT um, conditions, which is interesting. However, on the cold side, what we're seeing is rather than chlorite breaking down in these PT conditions, because we were transitioning through the lawsonite fluscious facies into these warmer facies of rocks, we're actually seeing lawsonite, this very hydrous mineral breaking down rather than chlorite. And so in the cold path, we're seeing lawsonite breaking down and growth of epidote um, versus this warmer path where again, we have chlorite being the main player. And so what this analysis shows us is that um, we're producing a bunch of fluids at the PT conditions of tremor and slow slip that could be causing these high pore fluid pressures. Um, and they're really forming from the breakdown of chlorite and lawsonite, and then growth of epidote, amphibole, and garnet. And so we can think, okay, where are these fluids sourced from? We don't have to have them sourced very deeply. These dehydration reactions in most of these subduction zones in this analysis shows that we can have in situ dehydration from mafic rocks. Um, and we're seeing sort of the breakdown and the metamorphic reactions that we're observing are chlorite and lawsonite breakdown, which is producing quite a bit of water that could be contributing to these high pore fluid pressures um, and leading to potentially these slow slip events. And so, you know, in conclusion, what I think we've learned today is that, you know, um, this zone is a really fluid rich environment and this high pore fluid pressure can facilitate both brittle and viscous deformation within the lithologies that we observe at these PT conditions that we think these rocks were at um, in this exhumed subduction zone. Um, this viscous deformation that we looked at in the schist can accommodate tectonic creeping rates at these lower pore fluid pressure conditions. And then as these high pore fluid pressures, um, uh, these pore fluid pressures become elevated, we can activate frictional deformation that could potentially accommodate slow slip. Um, and from our petrologic modeling, we showed that there's in-situ fluid production from the slab. And so this is a nice sort of petrologic contribution to slow slip and tremor, which I think is, um, as a metamorphic petrologist, is satisfying to me. You know, these rocks aren't just deforming, they're also chemically transforming. And so we need to sort of take that into account at the same time as we think about their mechanics. And so I just like to end this talk on this slide. Um, this is a beautiful photograph of, from uh, space of the Cascadia subduction zone. I live in Seattle, which is right here. Um, and I just wanna point out, this is a subduction zone that hosts slow slip events, is due for a large mega thrust earthquake. And there's over 12 million people that live along this plate boundary. And so uh, I think there's a lot to be done in this realm and a lot that's important to do in this realm because there is so much uh, seismic hazard in these regions and understanding how slow slip folds into that subduction slip budget is incredibly important for uh, understanding when, where, and how we might have a large mega thrust earthquake. And so I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that any of y'all might have. Thanks for listening. Thank you. A applaud for everyone. Uh, Thank you very much, Kaylee. Uh, are there any questions? Well, I have a question. Can you go back one slide? I think it was. I was curious about um, the white subduction zone on your plot on the. Hmm. It doesn't seem to have much dehydration, and I it just I can't quite read. Um, yeah, where is that, and what? what yeah, so that's key. That's the key peninsula in Ninkai. I actually have a slide for this because this talk, which sometimes is longer, <laughs> I could talk about it. So this is like this PT diagram here, and this is showing that key in blue actually now, right? Um, and you can see that key doesn't really work, right? 
compared to the other subduction zones. There wasn't fluid loss from any of the lithologies, really. Um, and particularly what I'm plotting just here is this uh, average morb. Um, but there are different thermal models for key. And so um, there are different geodynamic models that actually predict different PT conditions, taking into consideration um, you know, there's a, a, there was a change in the last 15 million years in key um, in the subduction rate, which can obviously affect the thermal structure there. And so if you take that into account, you can actually see we can compare like this is the, the classic Nankai um, PT path here in black that I'm showing from Ben Kecken in Syracuse. This is actually a slightly newer version. But if we compare that to models like this from Abers 2013, this red path that is taking into account that variability in um, subduction rate, um, and some models like what I'm showing here in gray that's actually including shear heating and other factors that can influence the thermal structure of the plate boundary, we actually can get um, quite a bit of dehydration at these PT conditions. And, and so what this says to me is that, okay, uh, the sensitivity of dehydration is to PT path is super strong. So we really need to like constrain these thermal, these thermal paths really well uh, in order for this sort of analysis to, to, to be correct or to understand really what's happening in dehydration here. Um, we use this path from Peacock uh, because we wanted to be consistent and use the same sort of um, publication for both uh, or modeling uh, approach for both Shokoku and Key. Um, but you can see here that it actually, if, if the path is warmer and you take into consideration these other um, factors that you could produce a lot of fluids at these PT conditions. But I think what this shows us is that like there could be up dip movement of fluids if these zones are colder. I mean, for example, like we think New Zealand might be a kind of relatively colder than these plate interfaces and it definitely has ETS. Um, and so there may be up dip movement, um, but I think it's important to remember that like there can be in situ production of fluid at these PT conditions. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, Jessica Warren, you had your, your hand raised. Hi. Thanks for a great talk, Kaylee. I really enjoyed that. Um, I had a question about the fluid saturated assumption um, and whether you have ways that you can constrain the actual extent of dehydration from field observations um, or have thoughts in general on whether it truly is fluid saturated. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think for the plate, interface, like for actually the shear zone specifically, not going deeper into the slab um, and other things like that. I think it's a, I think it's an okay assumption to make because we do see so much evidence of uh, fluid activity in this region. And so like the pressure solution creep within that um, metapellite like requires that there's a free fluid around, right? To activate that deformation mechanism. Um, all of the veining that we're seeing suggests that also. Um, and so from the rock record, I think it's it's not a bad assumption that it's fluid saturated. Um, now, if you go deeper into the plate, like absolutely not. I mean, I know, you know, this, you've been working on, you know, hydration at, you know, um, these transform fault boundaries, which are a great way to hydrate the mantle really well, but only in specific small zones. Um, and so, uh, one thing that I would like to do, and I'm actually working with some collaborators on, is thinking about if you have variable hydration, you're going to actually see dehydration reactions in very different locations if you're not fluid saturated, if you have maybe just like one or two weight percent water. Um, but from a geologic perspective, realistically, um, we're not going to have just sort of like diffuse partial hydration across the whole rock. We're going to have zones where we're really hydrated and zones where we have like maybe no hydration. And that's important for, for, for these metamorphic reactions that we actually, the rock sees truly. Um, and so I think, I think to answer your question, for the plate boundary, it's probably an okay assumption. It may not always be true, but it's closer to true than not. Um, but if we're thinking about going deeper down into the subducting oceanic lithosphere, no, I do not think that's an appropriate assumption. Yeah. Except maybe in the places where you've worked, if we we're subducting a transform fault, maybe then it is. Yeah, well, yeah, I, well, that's a great question as to whether you can see that higher hydration from a subducted fault um, in one of these records. Um, I'm, I'm wondering also if you can then turn around the modeling and say at what point, what is like the minimum level of hydration you would need to, to get the reactions um, and to see the, the slow slope? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think totally like a 
these models in the basalt actually take a really long time to run. They like take, you know, like 24 hours to run in Perplex. And so I have a first year PhD student who's starting to use Perplex, but we've actually moved into ultramafic rocks because they're much faster to run. Um, so he's investigating this sort of thing and in ultramafic rocks and maybe thinking more about like metasomatism. But eventually I'd like him to work on thinking about variable hydration and basalt, but he's just learning Perplex. And so it doesn't make sense for him to like be learning it with these models that take days to run. Um, <laughs> But I think that's a really interesting idea. The cool thing I think this is related to that is that um, right to get high pore fluid pressures, you don't just need fluids. You also need like not very much pore space, um, right? You need sort of both together. And so um, you can imagine a scenario where you could have a lot of fluid that's released in the rock during a metamorphic reaction. But if you also are increasing increasing the density a ton at the same time, you may not produce a high pore fluid pressure because you may open up a bunch of space. And so you actually have to have both like um, fluid release and then also like sort of not a big increase in the density of your material. And so that's really like actually what we see across this blue schist to epido, glossinite blue schist to, to epido blue schist and epido blue schist to epido amphibolite facies step across there. There's not really a density increase. It's, it's very minor. Um, which is a big contrast in between the density increase that you see when you move into the eclogite facies. And so that could be maybe potentially a region why we see these high pore fluid pressures at these conditions, but as you get into these deeper conditions, we don't see a lot of ETS potentially, maybe because that fluid that's released is just like able to live in the space that opens up as you densify the rock. Yeah, that's sort of related to what you're asking. It's an interesting aspect of this too, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa Kotowski, you had uh, your hand raised. Hi, Kaylee. Thanks for that. That was an excellent talk. Um, I'm curious about some of your uh, rheological models and how you've calculated, um, you know, like relationships between stress and predicted strain rate based on some of the microstructures that we see in these rocks. And so I'm really curious your opinion on how you think sort of um, heterogeneous mineralogies or different rock types juxtaposed together could contribute to like a heterogeneous stress field in these rocks. And so typically when we think about these microstructures, we think of like average or bulk flow stresses, right? But I'm, I'm curious if you could potentially envision that, you know, um, we could have sort of like stress concentrators in within either like a micro domain or like a macro scale domain where you have things like veins or different rock types acting to concentrate stresses such that we can actually get to high enough stresses to get some sort of strain rate, which could produce some sort of slow slip sort of at the margins of these heterogeneities. Do you have any comments or thoughts on that? I think that's a great point. And that's definitely not the analysis that we've done here, right? We've, we've been not assuming that we have these right, stress concentrations. Right. Which is very um, fair. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. Like. I think people have done some great work suggesting that at the margins of these blocks where you have strength contrasts, you're certainly gonna, you, you could have these, you know, um, ephemeral perturbations in, in stress, much higher stresses, right? And that might be a, re a way that you could get, you know, fractures that could form that could potentially be this tremor source, right? You could, you could have this tremor source be from hydrofracturing, but you can also fracture the rock if you just have these strength contrasts. And right, right. have nicely shown this in the rock record. Um, I also think you can definitely, I think you can, you can get to, to slow slip strain rates if you have that. I think um, one of the problems is really sort of, I think you can get that at that from a modeling perspective. I think it's hard and you know this because you work in the rock record. It's hard to get at this from the rock record. I think maybe right. you are maybe the, the closest that has <laughs> sort of gotten at, at this, but it's, it's difficult because um, the features that we're seeing in the rock, we're not necessarily sure if they're active all at the same time. So, right, right, you see all these fractures, maybe they're not actually active at the same time. They're all just forming at very different times. And for to accommodate slow slip, you need to have all of these features active at the same time across this. And so I think that's possible. Um, and it's certainly something to think about. Um, it just wasn't the approach that we took because it's hard to do. Um, yeah, and it's, it's sort of, you know, interesting to see what, what if we just assume that isn't happening? What do we see? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so that's no, a good question. Sure. Cool, thanks. Thanks for that, yeah. great talk. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Luciana Astis, you had a question in the chat. Hello, Kaylee. Um, 
I just wanted to ask you, I mean, like uh, Colima and Guerrero have very different temperatures because Colima is very close to the ridge and it's very young, subducting oceanic lithosphere. Um, kind of Guerrero is more middle of the road, you know? Yeah. So, um, do you take into account those temperature variations when you're doing these calculations? Yeah. So I didn't make these geodynamic models. I just mined them from the literature. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I am working with a geodynamicist now to sort of try to do this, but not from a kinematic perspective, from a dynamic perspective. Um, but for this analysis, we're just taking sort of geodynamicists that have produced these, uh, you know, PT path from, you know, their geodynamic models. And so Guerrero here is this purple unit here. And you can mm -hmm. see this little dog leg is where the slab is flat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. like underneath up till Mexico City and then it gets deeper. And then Guerrero or Yaliska Colima here is, this is this teal path here. Mm -hmm. You can see it is it is hotter, right? It's it's hotter, it's, the, yeah. it's in these, yeah. these hottest conditions. And this is actually why we see, uh, you know, in the petrological analysis, why we see breakdown of, of, um, of serpentine here, because it gets so hot that it actually is, is sort of reaching the breakdown temperatures and PT conditions of serpentine and releasing that. Um, so I think, you know, this is this is the work of, uh, of Vlad Menea and he certainly is taking into account that ridge, you know, and, and, and Yaliska yeah. Kalima being just like a warmer part of the subduction zone there um, than Guerrero. Yeah, and that's a good question. The other, the other issue, I mean, when you have your profiles of uh, where there's low events, okay, the, the range in Colima is much larger than in Guerrero, and Guerrero is just like almost a point source, it seems, just a yeah. depth, okay? Do yeah. you think that is an effect of instrumentation that maybe it cannot be um, recorded elsewhere, maybe because there's not such a good, um, such a dense network to be able to locate it? Yeah, I think that's everything. possible. Yeah, so like if you look here, right? So like in Guerrero, this is there's this like big, big huge patch of tremor right here, right? Whereas you know it's more diffuse here in Kalima. Um, yeah, I think that but that I, could be a function. But at depth, I mean, like look at the depth distribution; it's just like yeah, really different. <laughs> it's know? really different. Part of that is because the slab here is actually just like this analysis of just comparing it to depth um, is a good approximation. But when the slab is flat, you know, uh, it's all happening at this depth of like between 40 and 45 kilometers, but the slab is actually flat. So this could actually be happening across a large lateral range. It's just all happening at the same depth. Mm -hmm. um, so actually my PhD student that I was mentioning to, to Jessica is working on uh, Guerrero right now to think about uh, like not just comparing fluid production versus depth, but comparing fluid production actually along that flat slab path to see if this is potentially like, you know, because when the slab is flat, it's just sort of isobarically heating up, um, which is like perfect for these metamorphic reactions to sort of all be seen, you know, as it's just sort of like heating up at the same depth. But I think that's an excellent question and we should definitely think about that. <laughs> um, if I mean, this is that, that, there's thing. not that, I mean, the instrumentation is not as dense in that part. Now, now it might be changing because of the 2017 earthquake, you know, that mm. that's further into Mexico City. But anyway, yeah. great talk. I need to go. I have another meeting. Okay, so thanks. A thanks lot. for coming. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, other other questions for Dr. Condit? All right, well, if not, uh, let's thank uh, Kayla Condit again for the wonderful talk. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me, Kelly. This was really fun.